Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special installment of our bi-monthly transportation performance management webinar series sponsored by the TPM Pool Fund with support from the Committee on Performance-Based Management and Federal Highway. This is Christos Xenofondos, Assistant Director at the Rhode Island Department of Transportation and TPM Pool Fund Lead, as well as the Vice Chair of Astros Committee on Performance-Based Management. It is really great to see an impressive number of attendees to our webinar today, and I am sure that it has something to do with the outstanding group of agency leaders from across the U.S. that we have assembled for you today. Joining us today, our Federal Highways Acting Administrator, Stephanie Pollack, and uh, old neighbor to Rhode Island, uh, Caltrans Director, Tox Omish Omishakin, Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development Secretary, Sean Wilson, Minnesota DOT Commissioner Margaret Anderson Kellyher and Secretary Roger Millar from Washington State DOT. On behalf of both the TPM Pool Fund and Ashtos Committee on Performance Based Management, a warm welcome to our special guests uh, and a big thank you to all of them for accepting our invitation to be here with us today. This group represents some of the great leadership we have in the country to move transportation forward and I look forward to hearing their insights on emerging themes, strategies, and policies for transportation performance management. For more information on this webinar series, just visit the TPM portal at www.tpm-portal.com and click on TPM webinar series under events in the main menu. The TPM portal is where the TPM community can find the latest documents, videos, tools, trainings and event, and it should be on top of your bookmark list. You can access the presentations for today's webinar at the bottom of the webinar panel on your screen. Links to video and slides from today's webinar and archive content from previous webinars will also be posted on the ash.tpm portal site. As we start the webinar, all attendees are muted. If you have questions for the presenters during today's webinar, please use the Q&A feature on your webinar control panel. Our presenters will answer your questions during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. None of this would have been possible without the strong partnership between Ashto, Federal Highway, and the state that we were able to build as a result of the work from our staff liaison at Ashto, Matt Harty, our federal partners at the Federal Highway Office of Performance Management, Peter Stefanos and Susanna Reck, and the leadership of the Committee on Performance-Based Management. With that, I will turn it over to Susanna Reck, the Federal Highways Transportation Performance Management Lead and a great partner to the state of DOTs for a welcome on behalf of Federal Highway. Susanna? Thanks, Christos. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Uh, yes. Loud and clear. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Christos. As Christos said, I'm Susanna Reck. I'm the TPM team lead from Federal Highways, and I'd like to thank Acting Administrator Stephanie Pollack for her participation in today's webinar, and especially for sharing the Biden administration's vision for TPM. Um, thanks, this, thanks. Yeah. Um, hello. Hello? You're good, Susanna. Okay, I'm sorry. I was getting a lot of feedback, so I just wanted to make sure it wasn't me. Um, I also want to thank our esteemed group of state DOT CEOs um, who will be sharing their thoughts on the future of TPM. And I'm personally looking forward to hearing about their thoughts on performance management as it relates to issues such as liquidity, economic fatality, active transportation, and public health. Uh, we are so thrilled that so many people are here with us today. I think it's a testament to the interest in our topics as well as our esteemed panel members. I also want to acknowledge the partnership, similar to what Christo mentioned, um, the partnership that exists between Federal Highways, AASHTO, and the TPM Pooled Fund members. Um, it's by working together through this pulled fund that we're able to host webinars like uh, the one that we're hosting today. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Matt Hardy, who will give 
the welcome on behalf of ASHTO. Thank you, everyone, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. All right. Thanks, Susanna. I won't take up too much time. So I'm Matt Hardy, Program Director for Planning and, Planning and Performance Management here at ASHTO. Welcome uh, on behalf of ASHTO. As Susanna mentioned, this uh, Transportation Performance Management webinar series is a collaboration, I think a great collaboration, uh, among FHWA, ASHTO, and the TPM Pooled Fund. Because of this partnership, we are able to support the broad TPM community in sharing new ideas and building capacity on the topics of greatest interest to all of you. Um, I do want to highlight that this was sponsored in part by the TPM Pooled Fund, um, and at the ASHTO Board of Directors meeting last week, um, a new uh, TPM technical service program that will replace the Pooled Fund program was approved, so thank you to the CEOs here today for approving that, um, so that we'll be able to continue uh, the great work of the TPM Pooled Fund through the TSP. Um, so if you're from a state DOT, look for more information about that uh, in the months ahead. Our, our webinar today will highlight some of the important work going on around the country at the national level, at the cutting edge of defining the future of performance management. I also want to mention that we'd like to continue this dialogue. Uh, in fact, today's event will provide the context and framing for further discussion of potential new performance measures and new performance management processes, frameworks, et cetera, during the next joint ASHTO Committee on Performance-Based Management TPM Pooled Fund quarterly meeting scheduled for Thursday, June 17th, 2021. I also want to take a, a couple seconds to thank the great team at SpyPon Partners, uh, led by Hiana Park, Lori Richter, Perry Lubin are the ones that have been most active on this one. Thank you uh, to, 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 to your team, Hiana, for the great work that you do to support the TPM Pool Fund. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Hiana Park from SpyPon Partners to share our agenda for today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Matt, and thanks for that um, compliment. First of all, um, on our first up on our agenda today, we'll have Acting Administrator Stephanie Pollock from the Federal Highways, who, um, who will provide the Biden-Harris administration's vision with respect to transportation performance management. Then Director Talks Amishakin will talk about emerging performance management topics at the California Department of Transportation. Next, we'll hear from Secretary Sean Wilson of the Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development who will present the future of performance management in Louisiana. Commissioner Margaret Anderson Kelleher from the Minnesota Department of Transportation will talk about how her agency is using performance measures to drive progressive policies. And Secretary Roger Millar from the Washington State Department of Transportation will wrap up our presentations focusing on the value of equity in transportation. Um, so now let's get started with our presentations. Stephanie Pollock was named Acting Federal Highway Administrator on February 24, 2021. In this role, she provides executive leadership and strategic direction within federal highways to advance the goals and priorities of the department. She brings over 30 years of executive experience to the agency and most recently served as secretary and CEO of the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. I first met Stephanie when we were undergrads in the same dorm at MIT. She's been an innovator in every endeavor she's taken on since then. I'm looking forward to how she'll lead FHWA in the coming years for the benefit of our national transportation system. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie Pollock. Uh, thank you, Hina, and um, it's great to see you. Um, can everybody uh, hear me and see the slides? See the slides. Okay. All right, so thank you for this opportunity and for putting together such an amazing panel and also for the collaboration that has been going on for some time with Ashto and Federal Highway and what was the TPM Pooled Fund, and we really look forward to continuing that collaboration because as all of us are going to be talking about today, Transportation performance management is really important, and we're really still fairly early in the journey, and we have a lot to learn from each other. So I want to start with some basics, even though I think most of the people on this webinar know them. And the reason is, is because I went back to take a look at the basics from the federal highway side after I left my position on the Massachusetts state side to kind of remind myself of what Congress was trying to accomplish um, 
first in MAP 21 and then in the FAST Act when it established the Transportation Performance Management System. And you know, it's really interesting because it was very ambitious uh, what they were trying to do. They were trying to, the, the language that they actually used was to transform the federal aid highway program. You know, when we read section 150, which is the statutory basis for this work, we tend to start with the, uh, you know, paragraph B, which sort of lists the actual goals that we all have to follow or see which are the rules of the road. But it's really important for us to um, go back to, you know, first principles, which is we are trying to transform the federal aid highway system. And then there are four specific policies that are listed in that statement of policy. Um, and that is, um, that is uh, provide efficient investment, uh, refocus on our national transportation goals, increase accountability and transparency, and improve decision-making through performance-based planning. And um, I, wanna, I wanna talk for a minute about one of those, which is accountability. And I wanna focus on that because um, as a former state CEO and with four really great um, CEOs on our panel, uh, we talk a lot when we talk about the federal aid highway program, we talk a lot about um, flexibility. Um, sorry, I am having technical problems, but hopefully you're all still seeing my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, so, yeah. so, um, so we've lost the screen, program, we've lost the screen. Oh, now all it's right, back. Hang on. Oh, now it's back. <laughs> all right. Uh, so the federal aid highway program is 92% formula funds uh, and 8% uh, discretionary grants like infra and build. And, and um, that definitely helps states with, um, flexibility. Um, but it may not be as effective a method of achieving accountability because we're basically pushing $47 billion out the door every year and counting on the states to spend it on the things that will bend the curves that we are trying to bend. So to me, flexibility and accountability are, as shown in this picture, two sides of the same coin. And we need to get, if we can get accountability right through transportation performance management, that we continue to provide states with the flexibility that they're looking for in the federal aid highway program. Uh, so next are the seven goals. And again, it's important because I think once a federal highway put out its rulemaking on these, everybody immediately focused on the areas in which there needs to be target setting. But one of my messages for today, and as we talk about the future of the program, is we have not yet created a comprehensive transportation performance management system that will actually achieve all seven of the goals that have been laid out by Congress because we don't have targets that push us towards all seven of these goals. We have targets for some of them, but not targets for all of them. And as I will talk about, we're not actually hitting our targets in, in the case of many states. For all of them. So we both need to think about, have we set the right targets? Are we setting them the right way? Um, and what do we do when we're not making those targets if we're serious about transportation performance management? So as Federal Highway took the congressional language that was initially in MAP 21 in the FAST Act and turned it into a rulemaking, we focused on four of our existing programs, the Highway Safety Improvement Program to help us define the safety goal, the National Highway Performance Program, which is the basis for our pavement and bridge condition goals, the National Highway Freight Program, which is the basis for the freight reliability goal, and the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Program, which is the basis for the congestion and emissions goals. And, you know, the, the other thing that's important to sort of think about as we think about the uh, future of this important program is that, um, Different entities play a different role in putting the pieces together so that we have a comprehensive approach to transportation performance management. Congress, of course, set those national goals. Then Federal Highway through rulemaking laid out the six measures that we um, are expecting the states to focus on. The state DOTs actually set their targets. So if we have a metric for bridge condition or safety, 
there has to be a state target, but the target is actually set by the state and federal highway, uh, while we work with the states, uh, does not actually have approval authority over those targets that are set by the states. And then there's the process of getting from having a target to actually achieving the goals and creating the accountability and transparency that Congress called for. And that involves planning work and reporting work on the part of the states, again, with the collaboration and the stewardship oversight of Federal Highway. But a lot of this does fall on the states, as I'm sure the four CEOs who follow me are going to talk about. So Federal Highway did finalize a final rule on um, different metrics. This, this slide talks about the infrastructure metrics, so bridge condition and pavement condition. Um, it changed the pavement condition measure. It set out a four-year performance period with a two-year progress review, set out rules for asset management plans, minimum conditions. So infrastructure, you would think, would be one of the most straightforward places. Um, uh, but I'll talk about performance on infrastructure in a minute. Um, but the, the next thing that I do want to touch on, though, before I turn to that is, um, so what happens if a state sets transportation performance management targets and doesn't meet them? And the answer is, it depends on what Congress said what happens, uh, because it's not ultimately up to Federal Highway or USDOT. So for example, if you miss a safety goal, there is a consequence written into law, which is, and the consequence really for all of these is the same, which is you lose some of that flexibility, that funding flexibility that you get with formula programs, reinforcing my notion that we need to see flexibility and accountability as two sides of the same coin. If you're not accountable for the targets you've set in certain areas, the, the consequence that Congress has laid out is not to take money away from you, it's not to punish you, uh, but it is to say then you, we're going to loop, we're going to we're going to reduce your funding flexibility because we want you to make investments in that area where you're not meeting your target. So in the case of safety, for example, you lose some flexibility in terms of being able to reprogram mm -hmm. um, HSIP money, um, and you have to in your strategic highway safety plan you have to sort of lay out how you're going to spend all your HSIP safety money. Sorry. Similarly, if you don't make significant progress on the um, on the condition goals for bridges and pavements, you lose some funding flexibility and you have to reallocate money. So the system is really designed to give states a lot of flexibility to set your targets and to use your federal aid dollars. And the consequence after a couple of years, if you're missing those targets, is to is to sort of say you're clearly not investing enough money in meeting those targets. You need to take the money you already have, you don't get extra money, and direct it towards those targets. So that brings us to the question, well, how are the states doing? In some cases, we have one year of data, and in some cases, we are, we're approaching that two years of data. So um, for system performance, CMAC and freight, there were really six measures. Uh, reliability for trucks, system reliability, uh, hours of excessive delay, uh, non-SOV uh, travel, which uh, the two with asterisks are limited to uh, bigger metropolitan areas with a million or more, and emissions. Uh, and there is a process for a state and MPO target setting. And then there is a two-year review of the data that will be done by Federal Highway. So uh, this is actually, I think, just the year one data. Um, and, you know, to me, this is a sort of good news, bad news story. Uh, for non-interstate NHS pavement, for example, 47 of the states made significant progress, and that's really uh, great. Um, and of those 47, 42, so there's two ways to make significant progress. One way is you actually achieve the target you set, and the other way is you make what's called significant progress towards achieving that target. And in this case, 42 states actually achieved the targets that they set. Um, and so that is uh, great news. For bridges, it's not quite as strong. And I'm going to come back to this in a moment. We had uh, 39 states, for example, met their targets for the percentage of bridges that would be in poor condition. Only 30% met their target for the percentage of bridges in good condition. So I actually want to talk about bridges for one moment before we turn to the safety targets, 
because I think it's an example of the importance of getting, of defining what you're doing correctly and of setting your targets correctly in transportation performance measurement. You know, um, an acquaintance of mine who was a big city DPW director told me his first, um, his first experience with transportation performance management was when the mayor set a goal of getting um, a certain percentage of potholes filled in the first 24 hours after they were reported to the DPW. And at first he was delighted because they were hitting that target 90, 95% of the time and he thought this is great. Then he found out that the guys were not reporting potholes until they were ready to fill them so that they could report that all the potholes were being filled within 24 hours of being reported. So they weren't accelerating pothole repair, right? They were slowing down reporting. Uh, it achieved the target. That is an example of not setting a target in a format that actually accomplishes what we're trying to accomplish, which is why I say we have to keep going back to those goals that Congress asked and not ask the question, not just ask the question, are meeting the targets that we set in the rulemaking, but are we achieving the goals that Congress set out for us? So bridges is an area that I've been thinking a lot as we've been working with the White House and Congress on putting together the American Jobs Plan. And based on the percentage of states who are doing okay on their bridge targets, you would think that we're doing really well on bridge condition in the United States, but we're not really. This uh, chart, which is based on data from our national bridge inventory, but put together by the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, shows that there's been a very modest decrease in the number of structurally deficient bridges in poor condition from around 48,000 to around $45,000. And I would note that of the 45 billion plus in annual FAST Act authorization, about 7 billion is being spent on bridges. So honestly, getting a thousand fewer um, poor condition bridges a year when you're spending $7 billion a year is not necessarily a sign that we're making progress at the rate we should be making progress. But when you look under the hood of these numbers, the situation gets even more concerning. So the target, the, the goal that's been set in the federal highway rulemaking, uh, and remember I was not administrator, acting administrator when that was set, focuses on bridges that are part of the national highway system, not so-called off-system bridges, which are not on the NHS. So what we've actually done is push down the number of on-system bridges in poor condition to about 15,000, and we now have 30,000 off-system bridges in poor condition that we don't count when we do the state targets. And so actually what's happening is the proportion of poor condition bridges that are off-system bridges are going up and up and states are spending most of their money on on-system bridges, even though two out of three of their poor condition bridges are off the system. In addition, while we're doing okay on poor condition bridges, we're actually seeing the percentage of bridges in good condition dip modestly and fair condition bridges are also either steady or down because there seems to be an incentive in the way we built the metric to sort of go after the poor condition bridges and not do what might be more cost-effective bridge preservation work that would prevent a currently fair or even good, but mostly fair condition bridge from falling into poor condition. So if our transportation performance management system for bridges right, is just enriching the proportion of off-system bridges that are in bad shape and incentivizing work on poor condition bridges, but not on preservation on fair condition bridges, it may be that we're not, we need to make adjustments to that system if we really want to ensure that we're making the right investment in bridges um, under the transportation performance management system. So that's one example I wanted to put out there to sort of provoke some thought and conversation about how can we do better? Because that's really the question for this webinar. It's not that folks haven't been hard at work at this. We always have to ask ourselves, how can we do better? Safety is another area where I think we need to ask ourselves, how can we do better? So um, to sort of cut to the chase on safety, um, we're seeing a lot of states missing their targets. Um, 
Uh, in uh, 2018, 19 states missed uh, targets, and actually the majority of states did not make uh, progress over the two-year assessment period. They either missed the targets and, and did not, or if they, yeah, sorry, they either failed to meet the targets and failed to make significant um, progress. And we also, the serious injury targets were not met, um, and the non-motorized targets were not met. And you know, safety is another example of where you know some of the pushback that I get when I talk about this with states is, well, we're not in control. We don't really control the enforcement part. We don't control how fast people drive. And that's true, but we do need to lever what we do control. And we do control speed limit setting. And we do control the design speeds of the projects we build. And we do control whether we're building separated bike facilities in order to protect non-motorized uh, folks and help meet those targets. So we don't control everything about safety, but we do control some things. And I hope that the reaction to the um, problems that states are encountering, and remember the states set these targets, they don't even need to be declining targets. They're not approved by federal highway and yet states are not meeting them. So where I wanna end and turn it over to my state CEOs who I look forward to listening to is how do we take transportation manage performance management to the next level? So if we go back to those seven national goals, right? Significant reduction in traffic fatalities and serious injuries, highway infrastructure that's in a state of good repair, a system that's reliable, a system that in, in, involves a significant reduction in congestion, a system that strengthens the ability of rural communities to access national trade, we're not there. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not trending in the right direction on some of those, but we certainly have not achieved those seven national goals. So we have to ask ourselves, um, you know, are we, are, do we have all the pieces in place to succeed in transportation performance management? And what I would say is we have a tendency in the transportation world to mix up inputs, outputs, and outcomes. And inputs, you know, we tend to, before we had TPM, we actually measured success by inputs. It was just dollars and projects. That's what, that's what we counted. Um, we've made progress, at least we're now looking at other inputs like asset management condition and in the safety field laws have become inputs. But a lot of the targets and measures that have been put together since MAP21 are actually measuring outputs, right? Uh, improve bridge conditions, improve pavement conditions, maybe even lower emissions, but not outcomes. Because an outcome is, is my travel more reliable? Are rural communities better connected to the national freight system? Um, is transportation contributing to a healthier and more sustainable environment? Those are the outcomes. And so I would end by saying, you know, that we need to, we need to expand our, our, toolkit under transportation performance management. And we need to continue to think about inputs and outputs and even outcomes, but we also have to go beyond outcomes and think about impacts because the task that was set to us by Congress was to transform the federal aid highway system and therefore system change. And so if the goals and measures that we're working with under the statutes are really about, let's assume they're mostly about outcomes. Yes, we have to look to our left, look uh, downstream um, and ask, are we directing our inputs and measuring our outputs to achieve those outcomes? But we also have to look upstream and we have to start with the kind of system change we want. And I know that's what some of the CEOs are going to talk about in terms of equity, in terms of climate change, in terms of system reliability. And we have to start with those system changes and back into the question of, are we even measuring the right outcomes? before we ask ourselves how to change our inputs and outputs to achieve true transformational change in the federal aid highway system and the account of the kind of accountability that Congress calls for. So thanks for listening. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Yuna. Thank you, Secretary, Thank you. I mean, Administrator Pollock, that was great. So remember, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A panel and we'll address them during the Q&A session after the presentation. For our next speaker, we'll hear from Toks Omishakan from the California Department of Transportation. Director Omishakan was appointed um, director by Caltrans, um, of Caltrans by Governor Newsom in 2019. He manages a $15 billion budget 
and nearly 21,000 employees who oversee 50,000 lane miles of highways, maintain 13,000 bridges, permit more than 400 public use airports, fund three of Amtrak's busiest intercity rail services, and support more than 200 transit agencies. Previously, he spent eight years as deputy commissioner with the Tennessee Department of Transportation and served in the Nashville Mayor's Office. He is chair of the Active Transportation Council for the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials and is a America Walks board member. Please join me in welcoming Director Ami Shakin. Thank you, Hiona. Can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, yes, good. Yes, very clearly. Good. Uh, thank you for the, the introduction and thank you for the uh, support of this, this webinar series uh, and, and your continued uh, leadership and partnership in transportation. Thank you to uh, all the sponsors uh, and in particular, uh, thank you to uh, Ashto for continuing to put on uh, this, this webinar series and, and inviting Caltrans to be a part of this sixth, uh, this, uh, sixth webinar. And also uh, thank you to uh, Acting Administrator Stephanie Pollack for her, her leadership and her work uh, to move us along as a nation uh, on this very, very important issue. She, I think she did a very good job there of laying out sort of where we are as a nation. But when you think about where we are as a country, uh, as a nation, uh, I can't think of a more exciting time for us to be doing the work that we're doing. Uh, I call this moment a, a, a moment of a great pivot. We're in the midst of a great pivot where you have clearly a convergence of issues around policy, uh, a new policy ideas and direction, um, and resources on like we've ever had before uh, coming together to help us go down the path in a direction that we believe we should be headed as a nation. So it's a it's a very exciting time um, and a, a very uh, appropriate time, an opportune time, to be talking about TPM and how TPM ties into this overall uh, d direction that we're we're headed in, because the seven goals that uh, Stephanie laid out uh, there pretty well, uh, I think they're commendable. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on them at at, at Caltrans, uh, both with our MPOs and with our transit agencies. Uh, but there's a lot happening in this space. The, the TPM, uh, as she mentioned, is nearly 10 years old. Uh, I think MAP 21 passed in 2011 or 2012. A lot happens in a decade. A lot happens in a decade in the transportation space, um, and a lot can happen almost in a year. We completely live almost in a different world just in comparison to where we were last year to this year. Um, and though it takes often 10 years or 12 years sometimes to deliver a transportation project, we need to be open to evolving. And I'm glad the, the leadership at uh, Federal Highways, FTA, and my DOT peers that I have a lot of respect for that are on here are open to us making these uh, making these shifts as well. So next slide. So one of the most important areas I believe we need to start thinking about making these adjustments um, is on the front of equity. And I know my uh, my peers, my partners are gonna touch on this um, in a little bit more detail probably than I am, but uh, I'm, it's very exciting to see that the Biden administration um, is already sort of leading the way on this. Uh, we in California at Caltrans, we, we completely believe, uh, you know, we have taken the lead on this, that this is one of the most important policy shifts and policy ideas that, that we will make in the department. Uh, we're putting resources to this. We've created a brand new division, a completely new division that's working on this. We put out an equity statement uh, that addresses the issue of equity, but we also created a framework uh, that will guide uh, our decision-making. Uh, and we're gonna put, we're putting measures behind this that uh, will hopefully align with some of the direction that the federal government is going as well. Uh, it's good to see the signals from the federal government uh, around issues like the new RAISE program that's come out and infra, um, highlighting the fact that we need to do more for underserved communities. But let me just briefly explain uh, the framework. And not all of this is directly related to the system itself, if you will, 
uh, but very much uh, equity as a policy issue for uh, for a DOT, for any DOT, for any state DOT or city DOT, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, number one, our people, uh, we believe we should have a workforce that reflects the people we serve. Uh, California is a very diverse state, uh, but when you go to the, the, the varying levels of staffing within our department, uh, we think we can do better um, at the rank and file level, entry level, all the way up to the senior executive level of uh, staffing within a department, hiring, promoting, training, all those opportunities we think should be uh, open uh, to people regardless of uh, ethnicity, uh, creed, orientation. This is a key issue. If we're going to deliver a system that is truly uh, uh, uplifting and better for the communities we serve, we think the workforce that does that work should also reflect that. Uh, next, projects and programs. This is where I think a, a lot of growth has happened for us, all of us in transportation in, in, the, in the recent years, in the recent months, is we've increased our understanding of the impact of the work that we do, the work that we've planned and, and designed and built uh, for many years. We understand more than ever that not only did it do a lot to provide e-connectivity, uh, uh, it did a lot for economic growth and commerce, um, but it also had a lot of harmful impacts as well. And I think we're finally being as honest as we can be about this issue and saying, moving forward, we can't, we can't afford to do that again. That projects that we do, the, the programs that we engage in should provide uplift to all communities, including communities that have been marginalized or underserved for many years. That's what we're committing to with this with this P, this uh, particular P. The third P, partnerships. We have a robust um, budget related to small business and uh, DBEs at Caltrans uh, mm -hmm. in, in California. Uh, last year, we spent a little over a billion dollars, uh, $1.1 billion uh, on small business and DBE in our department. Uh, but when you look at the data a little bit more closely, it, it's increasingly uh, not the communities that we believe should be uh, should be having the opportunity. A lot of Latino, Hispanic, African American communities are falling short in some of the disparity goals that we've set, and so we believe we can do more here and create partnerships with uh, private companies as well and uh, community groups and organizations and engage like we never have before as we look to move forward on projects. And finally, the Planet P. Uh, we also know that uh, the projects, when we talk about impact, impact, we've had disparate impacts uh, in underserved communities and figuring out, figuring out how to have uh, performance measures uh, around the environmental impacts uh, in disparate communities uh, is also something that's key as well. Next slide. Next slide. So, in our department, we have a strategic plan that we uh, adopted in February of this year. We also have, also have um, a, uh, a long-range plan that we've recently adopted, and also uh, five priorities that we focus on every single day. And we've put some metrics around these five priorities that you see here, and some of these are very much related to the seven national goals, but we didn't create these based on those goals, but safety clearly, modality, we need to be more innovative. We need to be more efficient. Uh, speaking of project delivery, uh, part of the seven goals, and again, partnerships, how do we do our work more closely with the people we serve in the state? Next slide. So speaking of safety, um, uh, Stephanie uh, laid out very well there some of the safety goals that we that we have. I think there's a lag here in, in the next slide. I'll, I'll just keep talking. So from a safety standpoint, one of the things that we need to do is clearly address uh, more closely the vulnerable users uh, of the system. That we need to have a more targeted uh, focus here. Uh, when you look at the uh, data that's recently come out post the, uh, the pandemic, as we come out of the pandemic, I mean, you clearly see that uh, uh, pedestrians in particular uh, are seeing increasing numbers uh, in uh, serious injuries and fatalities. Um, in California specifically, the trips that are bicycle and pedestrian related are roughly 16 percent. But the fatalities uh, in the state for vulnerable users are 27 percent. Uh, so 
clearly there's more work to be done here uh, to hone in specifically on, on the uh, creating performance measures and targets for not just vehicular movement, but people sort of centric movement. Um, it, it, it's going to be, it's going to be, that's like, that's like, uh, so uh, when it comes to climate action, California more than any other state um, faces a, a significant challenge with the transportation sector's connection to, um, uh, to GHG, uh, to, to climate, uh, the need to address climate, uh, climate challenges. In California, it's roughly 41% of the GHG um, uh, emissions in the state. The national number, uh, I believe, is roughly 28 or 29 percent, so less than a third uh, of um, uh, of GHG nationally comes from the transportation sector. Even though this number on the screen says 41 percent, in California, this number is actually closer to 50 percent. When you account for all oil production in the state um, and the fact that the oil production uh, is related to the transportation sector, that number actually climbs a little bit, uh, a little bit higher. So, again, this—I I know this is already part of uh, the existing uh, TPM that we have, but there are many states that have um, issues here. Again, Ca California unfortunately leads the way here. Uh, I think a lot of attention is being paid to uh, the fact that we are all looking at electrifying the fleet, uh, the, the the fleets across our our, our respective states. Uh, Governor Newsom, uh, my boss here, has uh, led the way on this again. Uh, he put out an executive order uh, last year uh, during Climate Week that outlined the fact that by uh, by the year 2035, uh, roughly 14 years from now, every single new car uh, and truck sold in a state needs to be um, an electric uh, or ZEV vehicle, zero emission vehicle. Uh, even though that's the case, we know we need to focus on land use. We need to focus on better, improved mobility as well, and not just um, the fact that we're going to electrify, uh, increasingly electrify the fleet across our states. I think, again, increasing our focus on multimodalism is going to be key. We're doing that in California. We're putting more metrics and performance measures around this and all the other uh, key assets that we uh, have developed performance measures for, but moving forward, uh, the uh, acting administrator Pollock mentioned uh, the fact that we need to go to the next level. This is one of the areas where next level uh, we need to focus. We know the impacts on public health, uh, the environment, uh, and just access and mobility in general uh, to, to jobs, to to play, uh, et cetera. Th this is going to be this is going to be very important. Next slide. Uh, innovation, uh, big big thing to keep in mind here is uh, the, the fact that uh, we have the connected and autonomous uh, technology that is uh, that is still moving forward. Uh, California has led the way in this as well since the early 1990s. Uh, a lot of the testing track testing beds. Uh, for connected and autonomous vehicles or automated vehicles have has been in California. Uh, we need to continue to keep in mind that this is coming, and what that's going to do to the congestion measures that we uh, that we've put in place, uh, and uh, how to incorporate uh, the innovation and the technology that's happening around us. How to make sure that we're keeping track of that as well in the measures uh, moving forward. Next slide. Uh, on the mo mobility front or multimodalism front, one of the things we're, we're looking at is contactless pay and how that can help in improve transit, um, uh, transit access and micro mobility access. Again, um, something else to keep in mind, there are over 300 transit agencies in, in California um, and these micro mobility tools uh, are modes that we have. They're all not using the same form of pay system we're looking to integrate that in California to make um, uh, to make mobility choices more seamless. And so uh, we need to be we need to keep this in mind as well from a technology standpoint, uh, how we can start to measure improvements uh, in this area as well. Next slide, next slide. It's almost 60 years ago to the day, May 9th of 1961. President Kennedy gave an address to Congress, uh, and in, the, in this address, 
he was referencing the fact that his predecessor, uh, General Eisenhower, started the nation down the path of building this great interstate system that we have, uh, that we now know some of the impacts haven't necessarily been the best impacts. But I'll read this very quickly and keep in mind how this relates to this very conversation that we're having about that next level on transportation performance measures. Uh, nothing is more dramatically apparent than the inadequacy of transportation in our larger urban areas. The solution cannot be found only in the construction of additional urban highways. Vital as that job is, he's saying, look, we need to build highways, it's a vital job, but other means of mass transportation, which use less space and equipment must, must be improved and expanded, mass transportation. Perhaps even more important, Planning for transportation and land use must go hand in hand as two inseparable aspects of the same process. Lot, lot there, but this was 60 years ago, very much relevant to the discussion we're still having today. Now, it's good that we're thinking about uh, the assets that we've built, uh, this invaluable assets, assets that we've created, building immense bridges and a, a great highway structure and a system across the country. But let's not forget other key things we need to keep in, in mind. Transit, how that, well, how, how that uses less space and equipment, planning for transportation and land use. Thinking about those two things helps ultimately the system overall. They go hand in hand as two inseparable aspects of the same process. Very visionary president 60 years ago this month. We need to keep that in mind as we go to the next level on TPM. I know that was a lot, but thank you. And I, I'm not sure exactly who's who's next from my, my peers, but if you could pop on and then I'll jump off. Huyan, thank you. All right. Thank you, Director Umishak. And next we'll we'll hear from Dr. Sean Wilson from the Louisiana DOTD. Dr. Wilson was appointed Secretary of the Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development by Governor John Bell Edwards in January of 2016 and is now serving as secretary for a second term. He has more than 15 years of executive service at DOTD. Under his leadership thus far, DOTD has ushered in project finance and project innovations, including public-private partnerships and construction management at-risk projects. Since becoming secretary, DOTD has awarded more than $3.8 billion in construction. Dr. Wilson is a member of the Transportation Research Board Executive Committee and is Vice President of AASHTO. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Wilson. Wilson. So thank you uh, for the uh, introduction, Hayana, and uh, for the purposes of saving time. And I know my wonderful uh, fellow secretaries want to share. I will just echo all of the thanks and appreciations that uh, my friend Tokes shared with you, and I will jump right into the presentation because we're alphabetical and Louisiana comes before Minnesota and the state of Washington. Um, so, you know, we in Louisiana look at uh, asset management and performance management as a way to ensure our investment and policy decisions are informed by systems data and are performance driven. Um, this is done by putting our transportation asset management plan into action uh, by investing our capital and operating dollars uh, into programs that support TSM uh, and operations by relying on the state's emergency management plan, our systems management operations, uh, and of course, asset management. Under each of these three items, I will tell you, um, the one that is most evolving for us is climate change, and we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of what we're seeing um, under transportation systems management, operations management, uh, the environmental aspects of what we do, and then um, emergency management, our extreme weather situations proposes to give us some real challenges when it comes to performance management. Um, you know, Louisiana was one of the first states uh, to adopt a transportation asset management plan as a part of a pilot program uh, to serve as a guide for other states, and that happened in 2015. Uh, we updated it in 2019 with things that we've learned. And then our next update is going to come in 2023, where we're going to incorporate uh, climate change and resiliency, something that we had not anticipated when we first started uh, the asset management plan. 
And then also under this process, there's a state-based effort under the Climate Change Task Force uh, that the governor created. And that's important for us because in a fossil fuel state, um, this is the first time in my career in history here that we've had such a robust conversation about what that looks like and how best uh, to manage those situations. So let's talk a little bit about our transportation systems management. You know, our incident management system is something that has really grown and increased in terms of its demand uh, for the public as well as its utility by elected officials and others. And it's a very practical way for individuals to see the value of what we do and how we perhaps use data. Our advanced notification, our 511 system, dynamic message signs are all uh, cherished items, I think, on our system that have grown to be much more important and much more significant for the users of our system. And that alone gives me some really good feelings around the value that we offer. Um, something as simple as our motor assistance patrol trucks, probably the most popular thing that we do. I think it actually rivals overlays and new bridge work because it's visible, it's obvious, and it's when people are most in need. And that, to me, is what transportation systems are supposed to be about. Uh, very consistent with what um, uh, Administrator Pollack shared with you around the safety features of what we're doing. You know, we do not have uh, the best safety numbers here in the state, and we're one of those 30 states uh, that did not meet their goal, but we are committed to uh, constantly evolving and changing what it is we do in terms of ensuring our travelers are safe and our employees are safe. Everything from changing laws, which we're doing right now in terms of uh, creating a safety corridor, uh, to actually doing equipment options and uh, providing other changes on our regime of our lights and our striping and other aspects of what we do in addition to the engineering. These are things that are around the corners of the project and maybe around the edges of what we do, but they're significant in terms of if its impact. Uh, under the world of ITS, um, you know, we've talked about communication and the value of what that is. Um, you know, for a Department of Transportation that is typically not going to be actively uh, out there communicating most effectively, we've learned the value of social media, the value of messaging, and the value of communication. Uh, likewise, signal synchronization, taking advantage of technology to move people more effectively, more efficiently, and creating those options. Here in Louisiana, we've got a couple of things that I think speak to better performance management for us around our work zone management, uh, our ferry boat systems and how we're communicating uh, and being more efficient and how we're holding ourselves accountable, uh, as well as how we respond to complaints. That's something that oftentimes has gone uh, unnoticed uh, for citizens here, but when it starts at the executive in terms of me being able to respond to uh, those issues or questions that folks may have, uh, it's important for them to understand that we hear them and that we're engaged with them, not just in terms of the final product, but how we get there to keep them informed around what we're doing and how we're managing our system. You know, emergency management is something that um, I've learned in my uh, six years as secretary. It is probably one of the most critical aspects of my job uh, because it's going to determine success or failure as well as life and safety for employees as well as citizens. We're well versed in emergency management, not because we really like to, but because we have no choice and we've had quite a few of them. In fact, we're in the middle of one of those as we speak today. Um, so our State Emergency Operations Center is up and running and it is probably one of the saving graces in terms of uh, ensuring that there aren't any other catastrophic failures. Looking at how we've activated our response to events, we look at hurricanes, whether it's flooding, snow and ice, hazardous materials, all of these things are happening just within the last six months in terms of what we've had to deal with. And I've coined a phrase here that we've talked about at resilience conferences, that things are wetter, wilder, and weirder in terms of what we're experiencing and what we're seeing. As a result, I'm not sure that we as a state have really done as much of a good job as we can. And I actually spoke about this today with our, our legislative auditor around a performance audit that's underway. Um, we've not really quantified that for the general public in a way that makes good sense. And so incorporating performance management in this very difficult and diverse environment of emergency response, I think is gonna be very impressive for the public and communicates the need and the value of transportation. We serve as the lead support function 
uh, Agency for Transportation and Emergency Support, as well as Public Works and Engineering. All building blocks of safety, recovery, uh, response, all essential to what's happening. And when, you know, when we talk about these disasters, whether they're three million cubic yards of debris that's picked up, these are images from uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, that was uh, damaged and hurt severely in Hurricanes Laura and Delta last hurricane season. Um, just two weeks ago, we completed our debris missions in the state of Louisiana, and we're approximately one month away from the next hurricane season. In between these hurricanes, we had unprecedented ice storms in Louisiana where we were below freezing one or two days without any real sun, just complete overcast, where we had over an inch of ice on bridges. Why is that a challenge for us in Louisiana? Well, we've got the fourth largest bridge deck area in the country, 10 of the top 10 longest bridges, typically over water. And so this was a very common scene this past winter across Louisiana. We've actually exercised some strategic closure so that we can better use our resources, both human resources, materials, uh, and life-saving measures, such that in that freeze disaster, we had zero deaths related to the conditions on our road. Now, that is in contrast to the number of people that are unfortunately killed or hurt or injured and involved in crashes and collisions on our system on a normal basis. So at these peak times, we seem to, do, done a, to have done a much better job at how we manage ourselves and manage our resources. And just yesterday, these are images of the scene on the right is one of the scenes at an underpass here in Louisiana uh, where yesterday we lost four citizens uh, to this rain event with 12 to 15 inches of rain in a 24 hour period. Uh, three of them were drownings in vehicles. The other was a result of a utility outage where they had life support services. So clearly we can see how crisis management and incident management in these circumstances will ultimately affect performance management regardless of how we, we how we measure it and how often we measure it because this is gonna be front of mind for families and citizens for some time to come. So how do we manage that overall? Well, clearly recognizing that I can't control the emergency responses or the disasters rather that we are faced and only deal with it from a response standpoint. We look at our capital budget and our operating budgets as ways to make performance management real for Louisiana. Our budget petition is divided into five categories, uh, system preservation, which is primarily asset management, operations, motorist services, transportation systems management, and operations. Operations includes our district forces, which contribute to the bulk of the effort in emergency management before, during, and after an event. This also happens to be the place where the vast majority of the work on our system occurs. And so our operations piece is absolutely essential. And the general public oftentimes wonder why we fight so hard to make these investments in operations and protect them. And systematically, when this fails, the services of the department will absolutely fail because this is the human resource. This is the muscle of the department. They're called upon to make regular routine maintenance activities real. Everything from grow, grow, cutting grass, mowing cycles, guardrail repairs, cable barriers repairs, uh, signal head repairs, a number of items that are just routine things that we tend to not cut ribbons on and celebrate. And as a result, they don't get the political attention that I think that they deserve from our elected officials to say that's of real value to citizens. That budget petition here is the com composite of it makes our total construction budget. And this is important to note simply because um, citizens don't always understand government. They just look for a magic wand to be waved and to deliver it. But we're very thoughtful on what we spend, how we spend it, and the outcomes that it should have. And so each of these, this is an example of how we spend our dollars on system and off system. And look, these numbers are very small, but I will remind you that we're a small state, only about four and a half million people, predominantly a rural area. And we spend a lot of our money on our system preservations and our bridge work, both on and off system, because those are so critical to mobility. And at the end of the day, that is what really matters here. Um, we'd love to jump into the world of transit like some of the folks that you're going to hear about from today. The reality is without the financial resources, no matter how much performance management we have, the challenge is the more I invest in other services, 
the less I invest in the capital expenditures and the things that comprise our budget. These are the things that give us real big bang, whether it's ITS, and we talked a little bit about this in a minute ago, uh, traffic controlled devices. How do we deal with road roadway flooding? I think performance management in this world of disasters and resilience will help justify more funding for 3.7, more than $3.7 million when we have the type of images that we saw yesterday and we have the type of frequency in the violent weather conditions that we're having. In 2016, we had a 500 year flood and a thousand year flood three months apart. As a result, we increased our budget threefold in terms of what we're doing on statewide flood control. It's just a drop in the bucket. It will not create a ripple in the bucket considering the level of needs. But all of these are things that add value, but are the things that we're finding ourselves having to place the bare minimum because of the lack of resources. And as a result, our performance measures perhaps will ultimately show what that disinvestment is. And so Hyana, that's a quick overview of how we're operating in Louisiana. Uh, we see this as tremendously valuable to us in terms of how we present our system and manage what we do. Uh, and we look forward to having any questions that you may have. And I hope I was able to save some time for Margaret and Roger. Thanks, Sean. All right. Um, and next we have a recorded presentation from Margaret Anderson Kelleher. Margaret Anderson Kelleher was appointed commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Transportation on December 18, 2018 by Minnesota Governor-elect Tim Waltz. She began her job on January 2nd, of 2019 when the Walt Swanigan administration took office. She served 12 years in the Minnesota House of Representatives where she was elected as the Minnesota House Speaker for four years. While in the Minnesota House, she served 10 years on both the Transportation Policy and Transportation Finance Committees. Since 2011, she's been the president of the Minnesota High Tech Association. While serving as House Speaker, Kelleher oversaw the successful transportation and transit funding package, creating an investment of new and dedicated funds into Minnesota's bridges, roads, and transit system. At the, at the time of passage, the legislation was a groundbreaking investment in the multimodal transportation and transit system in Minnesota and nationally. And now let's hear from Commissioner Anderson great to be with you today. Thanks for inviting me to present. Minnesota, like many of your transportation systems, has many users and many uses. Like other states, our system is a complex system with the interplay of roads, bridges, sidewalks, bikeways, airports, rail, waterways, and more. So measuring performance can really help us understand more about if our system is meeting the goals that we have set for it. At the same time, every single thing we do involves trade-offs. Trade-offs that include the cost-benefit analysis, the short-term versus the long-term, and many, many more trade-offs. Our performance data really helps us make decisions wisely, and those decisions also rely on us to consider the needs of our users. And sometimes the changing needs of our users as well. This is something that historically we haven't always had as a piece of transportation systems. Certainly uh, early on in road building, it was not something that people thought about. In addition to uh, our traditional measures of system performance and, and safety, it's really to Minnesota essential to consider who we serve, the people who we have served and historically who have been underserved by our transportation system and how transportation can really contribute to uh, remedies for global threats that we face, things like climate change and what we can do to ensure that transportation is actually better serving communities. Today, I'm going to share how MnDOT is making strides in performance metrics in the areas of equity, accessibility or access to important destinations, why we do this work, getting people to and from the places they need to go, and sustainability as demonstration of the sophistication of the work uh, that we reflect on the needs, uses, and impacts to a very strong transportation system. We're gonna start 
in talking about measuring transportation equity. And in our thinking about transportation equity, we're gonna start with a few things that we know. And they include that the 1950s and 1960s in transportation planning led to some very serious inequities for BIPOC communities in Minnesota and around the country particularly in Minnesota, Black communities, as well as Indigenous people, were really displaced at times and also experienced business closure and wealth erosion. On top of that, it mostly took place in communities where loans were denied or housing was restricted because of, of deed um, deeds that had restricted covenants on them, which led to lower property values. Suburban sprawl also further increased segregation in our communities and income inequality. And our previous engagement process made it difficult for everyone to participate due to things like language barriers and lack of information in the communities that were affected. We also know and make it our general transportation goal that, it, that transportation support supports the health of people, environment, and the economy. We know that transportation equity also should be ensuring that transportation spending services and systems are fair and equitable to people, especially Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who really are empowered more in transportation decision-making than they once were. We are currently in the process of both developing quantitative and qualitative, qualitative, quantitative and qualitative measures related to transportation equity through a research project with Texas A&M's A Transportation Institute. The project includes developing new measures, but also examining our current measures to see how they might be modified or adjusted to better account for equity. What we know is that we need to be able to really disaggregate data to see and understand how the distribution of benefits and the burdens of transportation are shared or not shared. Minnesota has really been a state that has had high marks on our statewide measures, but we also come from a place that has some of the highest and worst disparities between white people and people of color. We can only see and understand more deeply what is happening when we disaggregate this data. Our data and, method also, data and methods also have biases and assumptions built right in them. It's true of any time you're working with models that the, the model is going to have the makers of the model's perspectives embedded into it. So we are embarking to really interrogate that data model and understand uh, where those biases and assumptions are and help understand them. Understanding the qualitative experience of people is also critical for us to be able to evaluate and advance equity. We really cannot solely re re we cannot solely um, be able to think about the quantitative measures. As an industry, we have to grapple with stories, the lived experiences, and be able to put those together with the data that we're seeing. As you can tell by this slide alone, that uh, measuring transportation equity is gonna be a multi-dimensional uh, piece of work that we all need to be doing together. We also are focusing on new walking performance measures and we know the importance and benefits of safe pedestrian networks to individual communities. For example, here in Minnesota, our indigenous communities, we have 11 federally recognized tribal communities are largely in the rural part of our state. And we also know that indigenous people walk more than others to get from place to place to visit relatives, to go to critical services like health and community services. We've just finished our first statewide pedestrian plan. And as part of that plan, we set a number of new performance measures and targets, including measuring the share of people who primarily walk to work with a goal of doubling that rate 
in each of our eight MnDOT uh, districts, the percentage of people who walk for transportation at least a few times a week, currently about a third of Minnesotans report walking at least a few times a week. Our target is to get that up to 60% for both health and climate goals. And we've identified a number of gaps in our existing sidewalk network, and we wanna eliminate all of those gaps. This is just more, it's more than just the ADA compliance. It's about ensuring that there's complete networks and doing the right thing for all people that we serve. The plan also is establishing guidance for preferred facilities based on land use context, which is critical. Uh, being able to put together land use and transportation is really going to help us be able to put those preferred walking facilities that may look different in an urban commercial district from a rural area. This is, I think, uh, a big step forward. We also are measuring climate impacts in Minnesota. And you can see here on this slide that Minnesota has been impacted by climate events. We already have been looking at what types of climate impacts we are seeing everything from the top three flooding, warmer winters, and invasive species. And those things all are in the very high to high category of impact. And then you can see down below, um, you know, we, we have a little less uh, impact of wildfires and severe wind. Those are lower impacts for us. But as we're looking at these impacts of climate change, primarily through those first big three, warmer winters, heavier rain events, and also seeing invasive species, Minnesota is really going to be one of the states heavily affected by climate change. Just a few things that uh, we are seeing going forward that um, we're really looking to tackle, and that is that these impacts are being felt disproportionately by BIPOC and low-income communities and they have a direct effect on both health and culture. For example, the National Climate Assessment identified risk to tribal nations from the future loss of wild rice habitat that is directly connected to the culture and economy of tribal nations within the state. We're also working to improve our data on climate risk and vulnerability and addressing future changes in terms of risk and likelihood and magnitude of impacts to prioritize the efforts and investments that we're making. While there remains a lot of uncertainty about specific changes, there's very clear understanding that these risks will increase over time and we need to work now to begin to better understand and prepare. The specific working efforts include working with other state agencies and university partners to be able to gather local data on climate risk and vulnerability, developing cross-disciplinary teams to improve our guidance and policies related to climate resilience, leveraging internal expertise and understanding on climate impacts, including hard data and qualitative experience from maintenance staff, funding research on climate impacts, including pavement performance impacts, with the increased freeze-thaw cycle that we face and developing measures to better track and support progress towards resilience goals. While state DOTs have been working together to share best practices and information, there remains ample opportunity to do even more in this area. And we've been encouraged by earlier conversations, early conversations with the Biden administration as well to support DOTs in this area through guidance, direction, research, and funding. One particular uh, thing that we have that we have, we're very proud of and have done a lot of work with is that we have built in Minnesota upon the 2007 Bipartisan Next Generation Energy Act. That act actually created reducing greenhouse gas emissions for the economy uh, 
as widely as we could see in Minnesota by 2015, 2025, and 2050. The good story out of that is the energy sector, who was really the first one to take this on, uh, did a very good job in Minnesota. But the state actually missed its first 15% reduction in 2015 and is not on track to meet the future goals, 2025, which was a 30% reduction to be, and 2050, 80% reduction. Um, in this work, 2005 is the baseline year. So in being able to really examine why are we missing, what we saw is that transportation is really the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. And while transportation emissions decreased by about 7% from the 2005 baseline, little progress has really been made over the last 10 years. So MnDOT is specifically directed by state statute to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. And in 2017, we adopted a state goal for transportation. And in 2019, we led the interagency work on pathways to decarbonizing transportation as both a project and a report that you can see here on the slide. Um, this was meant to identify strategies and actions that could make progress towards a low carbon transportation system of the future. One recommendation from that Pathways Project was to continue engagement with the public, private, and nonprofit sectors and community groups. And we did that by creating a Governor's Appointed Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council, or STAC. This is a long form public engagement process. It has everyone from uh, private, private sector folks to community-based organizations, city and local governments represented, elected officials, as well as uh, environmental justice advocates. And through all of the work, we are both looking at both climate and environmental justice. The stack recently provided recommendations to MnDOT to be able to really, uh, what, are, what are things that we can do together to reduce greenhouse gases in Minnesota? So I'm gonna dive into that just a little bit more deeply in our next slide. And so the top policy recommendations uh, came out of two committees at this point. One is a fueling empowering transportation group, and the other is a vehicle miles traveled reduction and transportation options group. And so you can see here that uh, the three top priorities that came out of each of these groups. I think most notably, um, the fueling empowering transportation group really pointed to us uh, the that Minnesota as a state needs to increase its infrastructure for fueling and powering. We also need to develop a clean fuels policy. And right now we're going through the process of having MnDOT lead that work for the enterprise. And then also making sure that there are incentives for electric vehicles, including um, dealership support and consumer rebates that are available in that area. Uh, in the vehicle miles traveled area, the, the probably the most notable recommendation is to adopt a statewide goal of reducing the vehicle miles traveled by 20% by 2050. And we have accepted this as MnDOT with a sort of preliminary, as a preliminary goal. We need to do more public engagement around it. Um, we have seen an embrace of this goal by the legislature as well. And it's unclear if the legislature is going to enact that this, this year. We are going into an overtime session here, a uh, special session. But it has uh, been an important piece to kind of get feedback already from our stakeholders in the legislature who overall have been positive about this. Um, also stopping expanding highway capacity, uh, 
uh, for congestion purposes. And uh, the other one is to prioritize transit, which I think is a, a key piece. I'm gonna go on to sustainability reporting and uh, share with you that we actually created our first annual sustainability report in 2016 that established a set of sustainability performance measures related to the transportation sector. And this has been an important uh, benchmark for us as we've been moving forward. The report has been evolving since, uh, since 2016. And in 2020, uh, the version which will be released next month will include 30 performance measures to track, report, and encourage progress towards goals established by statute, executive order, and agency, agency direction on sustainability. Um, 2020 is also the first year that the report adds specific performance measures around public health and climate resilience. Since we started working on climate action in earnest, we've heard from Minnesotans across the state that climate change and mitigating climate change is a priority issue and that they see MnDOT as a leader in the transportation sector and they expect MnDOT to lead on, on this issue. So the, um, the expectations are certainly not easy to meet in this area, but we view them as a critical opportunity, especially as we focus on solutions with co-benefits. And some of those include promoting electric vehicle and renewable energy can help bring new and private investment and jobs to the state while saving the agency money for operations. Reducing carbon pollution in pavements can mean longer term fixes and improve performance and reduce costs. Creating more walkable and bikeable communities can provide public, can improve public health, improve public safety, and reduce past and future inequalities. And leading on climate can help us also critically attract and retain talent as well. Close related to the work on vehicle miles traveled is equity and MnDOT has been interested in equity and accessibility for a long time. In fact, MnDOT has funded research out of the University of Minnesota since the early 2000 um, that look, 2000s that looks at accessibility measures. We now are the lead agency for the National Accessibility Evaluation Pooled Fund Project. And ac accessibility really gets to the purpose of transportation to connect people to important destinations. And accessibility makes our suite of measures more complete compared to our transportation only focused metrics. So what is accessibility, you might be wondering today? Well, we say accessibility measures the ease of reaching the valued destination. Accessibility is also about opportunities. For example, we can reach 100,000 jobs in 30 minutes, but because transportation exists to connect people to their destinations that matter in their lives. Accessibility provides the context and uh, for existing performance measure. And it also reflects both transportation and land use, which I already mentioned once before that development can increase congestion um, or it could also uh, help us improve accessibility. But we want to make sure that transportation investments can improve accessibility and encourage development and have it happen in a way that's meaningful for folks. Um, questions that we often have to ask in this area, is access low or high in regard to equity? How is access distributed across the population? And MnDOT reports on accessibility in our performance dashboard already. We've started to uh, work with access to jobs by auto and transit maps, and we're now including those more descriptive infographics like the ones that you can see here. This infographic has been uses the University of Minnesota's pooled fund data, and it shows accessibility by bicycle in this particular example. Another area where accessibility 
is important in the work that MnDOT's doing is on a project called Rethinking I-94, which is the project that's looking at the connection of Interstate 94 between our two cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. We contracted with the U of M to do an analysis and look at the accessibility impacts for transit and automobiles and look at a major managed lane project on the corridor. As we've been working through this, um, we have seen that this particular uh, corridor really has a number of levels of how we might address accessibility going forward. MnDOT itself has been a proponent at the national level, including through AASHTO's Committee on Performance-Based Management. And MnDOT has submitted a NCHRP report um, project proposal that's currently underway called Accessibility Measures in Practice. Uh, to help establish standard practices around accessibility measures. MnDOT has wrapped up a pilot study and the goal was there to test available platforms and to serve as a proof of concept at a project level and do the analysis to demonstrate how the um, accessibility analysis can be implemented in decision making. We have also analyzed accessibility on two transportation projects and as a land use example for a potential site in our rural area in Minnesota. MnDOT staff is learning how to use the conveyal tool, which we can not, now we can use and be able to project analysis and do the analysis of the alternatives in house. Uh, we feel that project analysis in-house is a good next frontier for us to be going into as we look forward to for the potential of estimating the impacts of transportation investments on travel behavior and emissions and identify ways to assess plans and projects for their future effects, lowering VMT uh, and greenhouse gases. And finally, uh, I just wanna thank you for this opportunity to present information on MnDOT's forward look on performance measures. For, the, for more information about our transportation performance measures, we have a great performance dashboard uh, dedicated to telling the sophisticated and nuanced story of our transportation system. I invite you to uh, access that dashboard and our performance scorecard at performance.minnesotago, all one word, dot org. Thanks so much uh, for joining me for the presentation today. All right, and wrapping up our presentations, we have Roger Millar joining us from the Washington State DOT. He was appointed to be the Secretary of Washington State DOT in August, 2016. The prominent theme that has run through his 40 year career has been implementing transportation systems that are not ends unto themselves, but rather the means towards economic vitality, environmental stewardship, social equity, public health, and aesthetic quality. His work on the Portland Streetcar and the Glenwood Springs to Aspen BRT provided communities nationwide with new modal tools. His complete streets leadership helped create a national movement for transportation systems that are safe, convenient, and pleasant for all users, regardless of how they choose to travel. His state DOT leadership is bringing innovation to agencies with enormous influence on the transportation investment. And now I'll turn it over to Secretary Millar. Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to speak with such a distinguished panel. It's unfortunate that I'm speaking last because they all always go long, but uh, I'll do my best with the time that I've got. I wanted to talk about um, measuring uh, what we treasure. I had the uh, opportunity uh, along with uh, Administrator Pollack to, to uh, be on a panel with Rebecca Pukura Ward from uh, Wakai Kutahai and uh, the New Zealand Transport Agency. 
And she talked about measuring what we treasure. I, I just, I love that phrase. So uh, at Washtenaw, we treasure racial justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And what I wanted to talk about was how we are measuring our performance in that space and how we are using those measurements to, uh, to move the agency. You know, as I said, we're committed to racial justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. We've, we've led the way in national conversations on this, and I'm, I'm really proud of, of AASHTO unanimously adopting a resolution that acknowledges our past actions, that commits to holding ourselves accountable, and that strengthens the agency's commitments uh, nationwide to the values acclaimed in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So we're looking in three areas. We're looking in our workforce development, we're looking in our contracting space, and we're looking at our project and program development. So in terms of workforce, we wanna look like the people we serve. We wanna be an employer of choice. We wanna create a modern workforce and retract, attract and retain great people because that's, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't have great people, you're not gonna do your job. So we've been measuring, and that measuring is leading to managing, and it's leading to change. Um, between January of 2019 and the end of December 2020, we looked at our applicant pools. 33% of our applicant pool uh, was persons of color. That's up over the previous years. They also made up 31% of the candidates that were deemed qualified and were referred to hiring managers but we only made offers to 20% of women and people of color. That's a problem. We've identified that problem and we're measuring and managing accordingly. Um, we expect to see a positive shift in diversity in our workforce over time, in part because we are measuring our performance and uh, we will be holding managers accountable for results. That 19.8% that of offers made to persons of color is going to double. Um, we are also doing a lot more to, to reach out in our recruitment policies and our, our outreach to more diverse sources of information. Um, we are looking at creative ways to fill positions. We have a new high school highways program that we started in 2020 to fill maintenance job openings. So we're reaching out to recent high school grads. We have a maintenance academy. Um, they're being trained, they're being mentored for the first two years, and we are covering the cost of obtaining a commercial driver's license. Uh, previously, we required a CDL uh, just to apply. Uh, we're doing a little different. And then on our Washington State Ferry System, the largest ferry system in the country, we are changing our uh, entry-level deckhands program uh, to be more flexible and uh, a, con a continuous process that brings people in um, on their schedule rather than having them wait around to an annual recruitment like we used to do. On the contracting side, uh, we still have a lot of work to do to ensure that we're equitable in all of our decision making, but we've made some great progress. And we are leading uh, state agencies in Washington um, with the governor's subcabinet on business diversity. Um, and we're leading because we do a lot of, uh, of federally funded work. Um, federal funding, unfortunately, is only about 12% of our budget right now, uh, but we're hoping and we're seeing some good signs from the Biden administration and I hope the Congress will follow through and maybe increase the federal share of Washington State DOT's budget. That would be great to have a strong federal partner again. But our federal DBE program uh, puts us uh, in front of all the other agencies in state government. Um, we, in the, the last federal fiscal year, set an overall DB goal of DBE goal in Washington State of 19%. Uh, we were always meeting our old goal of 11.5%, of so we stretched. Now, minority firms are available uh, at a rate of about 8.7% of the contractors in Washington State. Women-owned firms, about 10.3%, hence the 19% goal. Last year, our performance was 12.24%, um, as opposed to 19%. That was primarily due to a previous disparity study, which resulted in us waiving white women-owned businesses out of our program, even though currently they are in a disparate situation. It's the lag that happens. The waiver's been removed. We're setting higher goals for uh, white women-owned businesses on our program, and we're gonna see that 19% goal achieved. 
Now, one of the things that we have in Washington State, again, with our federal spend only being 12% of our budget, is an awful lot of our work goes out on state-funded contracts that only have aspirational goals. We had a uh, initiative pass here, Initiative 200, which uh, prohibits discrimination or um, providing uh, an advantage to any business uh, doing work with Washington State. And for the longest time, uh, the assumption at this agency was our hands are tied. Uh, when I came on board, I uh, decided I was not going to tie my own hands. And working with our attorney general, we came upon a legally defensible foundation for building a state-funded disadvantaged business enterprise program. And we are working hard on that. The first thing we needed to do was a disparity study. We had done a bunch of those for our federal spend. We did a disparity study for our federal spend and our state spend, and we compared and contrasted. So here's an example of being able to use analysis and data to drive change. What our disparity study found was that for the most part, our um, Hispanic-owned firms, Asian Pacific-owned firms, Native American-owned firms, and white women-owned firms, we were over that 80% uh, utilization mark that uh, is an indication of disparity. In fact, for our, our disadvantaged businesses in general, we were at 92.5%. The only place where we had a problem was our African-American community. We have a lot of African-American businesses that are one man in a truck or one woman in a truck, and they just were, were not getting contracts with us. Their utilization was down around 22%. But everybody else, in the bad old days, we would have waved them out of our program and their participation would have cratered and we would have done another disparity study and brought them back. But because we looked at our state spend, now you remember on our federal spend where we had condition of award goals, we were getting 92.5% utilization. On our state spend with aspirational goals, the utilization dropped from 92.5% to 33.5%. And we used that fact to keep those businesses in the program, even though they had fairly high utilization. And uh, we're continuing to um, contract with uh, disadvantaged firms in our federal program. And in our state program, we've put together a diversity roadmap. And I think that can be put up on the screen if uh, someone wouldn't mind. I did not do uh, PowerPoint. I didn't want to have you have to watch five of them today, but uh, I did put some stuff in the uh, in the attachments uh, uh, folder there on the on the uh, on the uh, webinar. I encourage you to download them and take a look. But what we determined was, you know, based on this I-200 and based on Ninth Circuit court decisions, uh, the famous Western States versus Washington State DOT. We have to have a narrowly tailored program. And that narrowly tailored program has to one, identify that a disparity exists. And then we have to show that voluntary measures don't work, that race and gender neutral measures don't work before we can put race and gender specific measures in place. We did our disparity study, disparity exists. We created this roadmap that shows how we're going to test each of the steps along the way. So on the voluntary program, we're working with the AGC and the American Consulting Engineers Council on a capacity building mentorship program that teams up a majority owned firms with disadvantaged firms and also makes uh, loans available to those protege firms participating in the program. We've since expanded it to include Sound Transit, our biggest transit agency in the program. We're in our fourth cohort with a fifth cohort scheduled to start this summer. Over the life of the program, 68 mentor firms have mentored 86 protégés. We have an alumni program underway, and great stuff is happening. The protégés are seeing their firm's capacity increase. They're getting new contracts. They're seeing increases in annual revenue. But it has not moved the dial enough. And because it has not moved the dial enough, we're moving to the next step which is implementing enforceable small and veterans business enterprise program goals. Those will be uh, you know, condition of award goals to, uh, in, to contract with small businesses. 
It's race and gender neutral, but all of our minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses are small businesses by definition. So we're going to try that. And if that moves the bar on disadvantaged business participation in our state spend, we're done. If it doesn't, then we have shown with data that a disparity exists, the voluntary measures don't work, then race and gender neutral measures don't work, and we will then implement race and gender specific contract award goals on our, on our state spend. And we're, we're hoping uh, that we're going to get to a place where all Washington businesses, regardless of who owns them, have the opportunity to participate in our programs. So data moving the dial. We're also working on bringing uh, young men and women, people of uh, color, into the construction workforce. We require that 15% of the labor hours on our contracts be performed by apprentices. And by working with the community and working with the legislature, we have substantial funding from our state legislature for pre-apprenticeship support services. Mm -hmm. And we've engaged our, our labor organizations in Washington State, our community organizations, community colleges, and the like. And right now, 43% of the apprentice hours performed on our contracts are performed by women and people of color. In particular, we're bringing African-American individuals into the workforce. 32% of the, of, of the apprentice hours are performed by African-Americans. And we're looking to raise that even more. Our legislature uh, just adopted a budget. The governor signed it yesterday. It's doubling our pre-apprenticeship support services program budget, showing that you know, data can drive results and data also attracts funding. So we're excited about that. The last thing we're working on is an equity analysis of our projects and our programs. It's something we haven't done before, but we're scrutinizing our outcomes to determine if our processes and our actions and our services are creating barriers to participation by all Washingtonians. We'll then evaluate if we need to do more to ensure equitable outcomes. So the stuff we're looking at, and we're, we're contracted with uh, one of our fine universities out here is we're going to look at um, the equitability of our right-of-way practices as we purchase or condemn properties. What are our valuations and are they affected by, um, by equity in any way? We're looking at our highway construction program and the equitability of that, agency workforce recruitment and compensation. And then we're also doing a literature review to see what other states are doing um, so that we can steal their good ideas and make them even better in Washington State. So um, thank you for the opportunity to present. I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Secretary Millar. Um, this is Matt Hardy coming back. Uh, I know that we are six minutes past 3.30 Eastern Daylight Time, uh, but hopefully uh, some of the panelists can um, stick around for a few minutes uh, and kind of ask some questions. So those that are on, if you could turn your cameras on, uh, that would be great. Um, so the first question that I have uh, came from an audience member is um, kind of focusing on uh, what Stephanie, and, and, and Stephanie uh, unfortunately had a hard stop at 3.30, so she is not with us. Uh, but it was following on one of the, you know, a point that she made about outcomes. Um, and the question is, how can the existing TPM system be uh, um, evolved to focus more on the longer term or sort of longer time frame outcomes or goals uh, that she mentioned, uh, instead of trying to sort of set and, and meet specific short term targets that is sort of, sort of the emphasis right now, bridges, safety for the next you know couple of years or something like that. It's a great question, and I didn't really talk about that in my presentation, but we, we need to move to outcomes. Uh, the, the difficulty we'll have in moving to outcomes is that look how long it's taken us to get where we are. Um, we, we will get there, um, but it, it takes a concerted effort. And I know when the seven measures were adopted and we, we, we were all moving on that, everybody took a big sigh of relief and moved on to other stuff. Um, we will need to go back and revisit that stuff again and again and again. Um, what I find is when uh, when your your measurement, when you set a target and you don't meet it, and there are consequences, uh, things happen. Uh, when there aren't consequences, uh, we're just doing work for the sake of doing work. 
but I, I do applaud the the notion of of let's look at outcomes. You know, look the equity conversation that that I just had. Um, I don't care how we get our disadvantaged business participation up. If voluntary measures work, that's great. If race and gender neutral measures work, that's great. But I've got a lot of tools in the toolbox. I don't necessarily need to measure how each of those tools is working. I need to measure the outcome, which is dollars in the pockets and wealth generated in um, our minority community. Just, just real quickly, I'll, I'll add. I'll, I'll echo what uh, Roger uh, just said. I, I think, I think he's spot on. Look, we, Matt, we have to, we have to face this head on. I mean, I, I think we have in the past, in the recent past, skirted facing true outcomes and focused on what I think were really needed. Uh, these more sort of short-term focused goals for now. I, I think we needed to do that as a start because we didn't have anything before. MAP21 started all of this. But when you think about something like the GHG targets that all of us discussed pretty heavily and was very contentious, and we said, look, I think for now we're just going to pass on this, and we never really did sort of go down that path. Those are outcomes that we, the type of outcomes that we increasingly need to, to talk about and focus on that we, we've kind of passed the buck on a little bit. But uh, having conversations like this as uh, we as we try to find a next level path forward, uh, I, I think is exactly what we need to be doing to have a uh, the serious changes that we need uh, in this place. But we got we got to face them head on. We can't because they're challenging. Doesn't mean we uh, we skirt them like we may have done a little bit in the past. I think you're on mute, Matt. Sorry, um, I'm trying to keep my the volume down. Um, Sean or Gene, and I, I was, I was uh, forgot to mention that uh, Gene Wallace works at Minnesota DOT and is filling in for um, Margaret Anderson Kelleher, who can't be here in person. So sorry about that, Gene. And I'm, I'm fine with their answers, Matt. I, okay. I'm, I don't have anything to add. I'm, I'm good about not necessarily repeating. Great. That's not saying I agree with uh, Roger and Tokes all the time, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I, that's what I tell people. Uh, next question, and they're just sort of, sort of three questions, just to sort of mix it up a little bit. Um, talks about the uh, target setting process. There were a couple questions that came in about this. Um, there are some that suggest that targets sh should only show maintained or improving condition. Others that suggest targets need to be based upon available resources and what can realistically be achieved. For example, for safety targets, if you can set increasing targets, does measuring um, the the whether or not you made you know um, achievement of those targets does it really matter for agencies if you can set you know targets that show a decrease in performance? Well, well I'll tell you, Matt, I'm I'm not a big fan of of showing decreased in decrease in performance and using that as a goal setting measure. I think we have to be real practical and use common sense and, and what we do. Um, and just to show improvement, if there's not improvement, then let's understand it and let's not necessarily celebrate uh, our lack of success in an area. Uh, but I also don't think that you avoid the reality of what we're doing, particularly when it comes to something like safety that it's so clear uh, and significant and impactful uh, on your citizens. Um, having available resources and being practical, absolutely with every goal, I think you have to do that. But I think it needs to be in the right context of improvement overall and not um, you know, measuring the success of improving less. Uh, on it, I'd like to add a, just a little to that. You know, you you should targets should be about the desired future state. It, it, they should not be resource constrained at all in terms of setting a target, or maybe resource constrained, but but not to the exclusion of that desired future state. And then you can use if you're not meeting the target, like our asset management system in Washington State. We've identified we should be spending $2 billion a year on maintaining what we have and preserving what we have. We spend less than half of that. And the fact that we've set targets and we're not achieving them, I'm able to communicate again and again and again to decision makers 
And now state of good repair is at the front of everyone's mind as we have a discussion about new revenue. We need to do the same thing with safety. We need to do the same thing with equity. Um, if you set easy to reach targets, what you're telling everybody is everything's fine. And, and we know it's not. So I'm, I, I don't like saying here's our safety target and we're not meeting it. I get beat up on that, but I'd rather get beat up on that than, uh, than set a goal that anybody could meet uh, when the reality on the ground, the outcome is people are dying. So, so I, I, I don't agree with everything that that, that Raja and and, and uh, Sean say as, as well, but but uh, uh, completely agreeing here with with uh, with the sentiments so far. Uh, and on Roger's last point about goal setting, sometimes I think the way things are sort of set up right now is states are setting targets for example, on safety that they believe are achievable or reachable targets and not being as aggressive as we possibly can be because it's associated and tied into to resources and to funding. And so people are going to say, well, you know, I'm not going to set that high mark or high goal because if I don't reach it, there may be a, a, a penalty from a funding standpoint. Somehow that has to be turned around. Somehow that needs to be adjusted and, and changed to make sure that we're encouraging one another to keep shooting for uh, that desired state that Roger's talking about, regardless of what it is. I, I'm mentioning safety specifically, but it, because that's one that I, I think all of us are keenly focused on, regardless of the state that you're in. But somehow we have to make adjustments there so that you know you're not penalized for being aggressive um and it's sort of set up in a, in a roundabout way right now to be uh to be that way yeah just it's it's the cultural paradigm in dot's that's shifting you know the the it was really really difficult for anybody in you know your father's dot or your grandfather's dot to admit anything less than perfection <laughs> we're, we're perfect and getting better every day right now, you know, I, I spent a good part of my career in the planning profession as a city planning director, and I was wrong all the time, and, and I freely admit it, you know, I'm wrong all the time. Um, being able to say, we're not meeting the target and keeping your job, you know, is, is a, a place we have to be as CEOs, we have to be comfortable saying, we're not meeting the target, maybe at the risk of losing my job. But if I if I'm not, talking about those asked outcomes, if I'm not planning a flag out there, uh, we're not going to advance. And it's, it's something just like we, the, the position we took on equity, it's a place where we need to lead. Great, thanks. Um, and then last question, and thank you for spending an extra 15 minutes with us. Uh, last question is more of an open-ended one. Um, sort of focusing on uh, what do you see or what do you think the focus, again, focusing on the sort of that national level that all the states are going to have to be dealing with and, and like the MPOs. Um, so what do you think we should focus on at the national level to advance transportation performance management as quickly as possible? What do you think you need as a state DOT CEO resources? What can the AASHTO Committee on Performance-Based Management be doing for you? Um, how can we be working with FHWA? I can start on this one. Um, I, I think first and foremost, you know, we really need our, our uh, performance measures at a national level to be practical, to be measurable, to be meaningful, most of all. And, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about today about penalties, and I think we need to see less emphasis on penalties for targets not being met. Um, you know, it doesn't feel like those those penalties serve to really recognize the complexity of our system performance and all the users it serves. Um, and it, we need to just ensure that the funding levels are congruent with uh, state and local agencies' investment levels as well. And, you know, as compared to the federal funding levels, there are definitely some opportunities for balance between a national system um, or a national approach and, and local needs there. And we just need to, um, recognize all of the the different nuances and sophistication of our of our total system to make sure that our measures are kind of reflective of that tokes or roger yeah 
Can you hear me still? Yeah, it looks like I'm still on. Yeah, I, I, I agree actually with Gene as well. Gene, welcome to the Agreement Club. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the comment you made about, about it being uh, meaningful and, um, and measurable or I think we need to are things things we need to focus on even more. But but I think our industry, we in this space, I think we're realizing more and more uh, the broader uh, impacts of the work that we do. I think we've always known that, but I think we're understanding that more. And so connecting our measures to uh, the to be to become more people centric, to be more focused on outcomes that we want to see for the people we serve. Uh, I think it's some it's it, it's hard uh, to think about, but it's something we need to start doing. And I think the the discussions around equity, around public health, um, and how it's connected to our work is something that we need to start figuring out how to infuse more and more into the into these uh, to these measures, and, and no doubt resources as well, Matt. Um, sort of that needs to be connected to it um, and uh, rewarding. Uh, you know, probably a little bit more of a carrot versus a stick um, uh, may be a good idea for people who are who are um, being aggressive and achieving uh, the, the targets that they want to achieve. Uh, I think that sends a message as well. Similar to the, uh, you know, to the effort, I know it's not completely related, but the discretionary grant programs like RAISE and, and INFRA, how those have been adjusted and just within the last five months to say, okay, here's what we see as more of um, of the outcomes that we want to achieve as a country um, and aligning um, the measures with that as well. So thank you. Yeah. I, I, I think the notion of uh, penalties for not achieving goals is a, is a bad idea, but I think the notion of establishing the baseline and then having incentives or programs that are only available to agencies that meet that baseline um, is something we ought to be talking about. I think we also ought to be talking about, uh, are these things weighted or ranked in any way? Um, you know, here in Washington state, uh, there's a consulting firm every other week, there's a consulting firm or a university that comes out with a story about how congested our roads are. And so there's a lot of talk about spending money on, on solving congestion. Now, congestion costs our state's economy $5 billion a year. And when you look at my agency's budget, we spend about a billion dollars a year in our construction program on congestion management projects. But when you quantify the crash data, when you take the crash data and monetize it, crashes cost our state's economy $15 billion a year, over three times the cost of congestion. But our safety program, our funding that's dedicated solely to safety, is 50 million a year. So if you're not meeting the safety target, should you be spending money on adding capacity to the system? I mean, those are conversations. I, I don't know the answer to that question, and it may differ from state to state. But you know, just putting this in and in, in looking at, at the 52 agencies, getting to agreement on what would be at the top of the list would be tough. Because it was a, it was hard to get to seven that are all considered equal, um, but we do need to be thinking about innovating on a foundation of a system that's safe and resilient, and working on management of that system to get <clears throat> to get the most out of it, and managing demand, and then, <clears throat> then looking at capacity. Ooh. Great. Get the water in there, Roger. <laughs> Thank oh, you very God. much. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank, um, I think we're at the end of our time here. So I want to say very much thank you to, uh, to Stephanie and Sean, who had to uh, step off uh, for other meetings. Roger, Tokes, Jean, uh, Margaret, uh, who couldn't be with us. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to your staff who supported you. It was great. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you. Um, uh, so th thank you very much. Um, just want to remind everybody out there uh, that uh, our, our next bi-monthly TPM webinar is happening on July 21st at 2 p.m. Um, we don't know what the topic is going to be, but it's going to hard to top this one. Uh, I'll tell you that right now, but we will uh, try. Uh, you can go to the the Transportation Performance Management uh, web portal, tpm-portal.com, and sign up for all the webinars. People have been asking about presentations, recordings. You can
can also view recordings there. Again, it's tpm-portal.com. Again, thank you to everybody, um, to all the presenters, to all the participants for sticking around for an extra 23 minutes. Um, have a great rest of the day, a great rest of the week. Stay safe. Um, and uh, that's we'll, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Excellent work, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Great work.